It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's the Jill on Money Show. We are so delighted that you're joining us this weekend, September weekend. Mark, I'm kind of getting over these 80 degree days that are still going on in September here in New York City, right? The worst. The funny thing is, uh, by the way, I had last weekend, I went into the ocean and it was really warm. But then because there was like huge waves and riptides the following day, I couldn't really go in for a swim. But um, you know, so it's great for swimming, not so great for walking the dogs, got to say, you know, being back in the city and all. Anyway, this is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And we do that by answering questions. Which questions? Your questions, of course. All you need to do is go to our website, jillonmoney.com and get excited because that website is changing. Ugh. Mark, when do I have to pay this woman some money? All right. So I got to pay this woman some money. Mark's like, she's not asking. I bet she's asking for it now. So we're going to have a whole new web design. I'm very excited. Also, Mark, I got the official, uh, I'm writing the second book. Need that. Yeah. So we need, uh, we're going to have to make some space for the second book. Cannot believe I'm doing this again. Remember I swore I'd never do it again. Who did I swear to? Not to a God, I'll tell you that much, but I really never thought I would do another book, but I had an idea. And you know where the idea came from, Mark? This show. This show and our other two podcasts. No, but they're going to be, it's going to be interesting because I started to go through some of the great people who contacted us. And it's really a, it's really about the pandemic in, and what we've learned from the pandemic and how we can grow after the pandemic. That's really the the core premise of the book. I'm not telling you the title yet, but it really is about what we've learned from so many of you. And I, I just, I get tickled by that. And I, it also excites me. It was, a, it was, a, the proposal was very easy for me to write as opposed to the last one, which killed me. And this one really just flowed. And Jackie said to me, I, I mean, I, I wrote it like one morning. I was up at four o'clock in the morning until six o'clock. I said, okay, I'm done. She goes, what do you mean you're done? I said, yep, done just done, just did it, banged it out two hours. And it just flowed so easily. That's how you know you have a good idea. So um, we love to hear from you. Go to the website, jillonmoney.com, which is going to be a new website very soon. And uh, check it out, jillonmoney.com and hit the contact button if you have a question for us. Okay. So here is a note from Kevin who has a philosophical question. Kevin says, my wife and I are 34 years old and they are in good to great financial shape. I find planning our finances enjoyable. By the way, Mark, always enjoyable when it's good to great, not so enjoyable when it's good to crap. <laughs> anyway, listen to this. This guy coded his own fairly comprehensive retirement model. Maybe we could put his model on the website. Hmm. Anyway, his issue is relatively small changes in his assumptions for return rate or inflation rate have huge effects over the next 60 years to the point where even a plus or minus one percentage point change can be the difference between being wealthy or insolvent at age 95. When you start to under include uncertainties in the healthcare system, social security, is there any point to try to forecast our eventual retirement at our age? Simple rules like 4% rules seem to simplistic to account for all these changes that can occur. How should someone at our age think about retirement planning? Mark, do you think he's overthinking retirement planning? I mean, he can give us the numbers. He says that at age, their mid thirties, they got about 950 grand and they need nine, about $70,000 in today's dollars for retirement. I mean, philosophically, what I would say is this, you always choose to run models at the more conservative end. And so if that means that you're running, I mean, obviously there's a huge difference between running inflation at 2% and 3%. I would be running at 3% inflation just to see, just for the heck of it, see what happens. And I would run your rate of return at say 6%, see what happens. And I would see that, you know, your 
um, you know, really the biggest thing is, is uh, your date of death and 95, that seems reasonable. See how you do. And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say a 4% rule. I just would see what would it take for me to live at say a 3% withdrawal rate and run that number. And don't presume that social security is going bust. Say that you're going to get some, whatever the social security estimate is at this moment and, and go from there. I just don't think the, the philosophical question that you're asking is you cannot account for all these variables, which is why financial planning is an ongoing exercise. It's not a one-time event. Mark, do you have anything that can make Kevin feel better? Also, what is he going to do with all his time if he stops doing his financial planning? Think about that. He'll new, he'll need a new hobby. Keep doing what you're doing. Mark says you're going to be fine. I agree with that. I'd like to have you come on the air with us. I really would. Uh, Mark, this is the kind of person it would be interesting to really kind of dive a little deeper with. And that's why we do encourage you to come join us here in the Sleep Number Virtual Studios. Because if you do that, then we can really kind of noodle around a little bit more. So you gave us some of the basics, but I'd be interested in why you are finding this so um, upsetting or philosophically, maybe not upsetting, but why is it why is it throwing you off the course that you're on? You seem to be in just fine shape. Can you not accept that things are good? Reminds me of that New Yorker cartoon. I can't remember, I think Roz Chas did it. And the caption read, what if things go all too well? <gasps> what if things go all too well? And you'd be fine. You know, that's, that's, that's the good news. So sometimes people move the goalposts also. I was just talking to some folks who were in the fitness industry. And I said, you know, what I do is like what you do. And um, people say, I want to do this, 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 and this. And then they do it. And then they say, well, you know, I know that was my old goal. I want a new goal. And it's okay to set new goals, but goals that are achievable, that make sense. Like to say to somebody, um, you know, you need this much money to retire. You get to this much money and you drive yourself crazy. You say, no, I think I need more. Well, we, but you don't, you know, you probably don't. You probably need what exactly what you thought you needed. So I, I would encourage anyone who has a question like that, who feels a little, I don't know, maybe a little bit daunted by the experience of going through financial planning or maybe doesn't quite believe the numbers. Why don't you allow us to help you? How about that? And we would be delighted to do so. So come on the program with us. Again, it's very easy. Go to the website, jillonmoney.com, hit the contact button, and we'll get your notes. Say, give us a little bit of the details of what your question is and say, I want to come on the air. And Mark will do the rest in between his home improvement project, which is probably about to start and drive him crazy. So everyone, be nice to Mark. So really, I, I that's what I'm doing today. I See how zen I am, Mark? It must make you feel much better. At your anxiety level, I'm I'm taking the inverse of that to try to take it down a little bit and sort of be your foil today. I'm going to be calming, Aunt Jill, calming. I know. Yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm calming Jill. I'm usually not, but today I will be. Okay. Jillonmoney.com. That is the website. Tell us if you want to come on the air. Ask us your financial questions, and we will be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here to try to help you take the mystery out of your financial life. And we do that by answering questions of yours or bringing you great guests. So that's also a fun thing that we do. If you have an idea for a guest, let us know. Um, Mark, I sent you one. What did you think of that last author I just sent you, that dude from the Financial Times? Should we do him? I think so, too. First of all, I love the name, but I won't say it right now. But just saying that name makes me smile. Um, okay, so here's something that I want to remind everybody. And that is that when you're going through the financial planning process, we just talked about that in the last question, 
you may want to seek some outside advice. Not everybody can be like Kevin and code his own retirement scenarios. So if that's you, go check out Facet Wealth. That's the sponsor of this program. FacetWealth.com is their website and they provide financial planning for lots of different kinds of people and they do it for a flat fee. And I like that model quite a bit. Facet Wealth does goal-based financial planning. You get a dedicated certified financial planner, not just a random person in a call center, and there are no wealth or account minimums. So that to me is kind of fantastic. So check it out, facetwealth.com. Okay, let's go to take a call. Our caller is Tim from the Bay Area. Hi, Tim. What can we do for you? I'm not calling to ask if I can retire. We are already enjoying freedom. Yes. When we listened to one of your podcasts recently about financial literacy, it made me think about my history. In the early 80s, I was just starting my career in corporate America, and a very senior colleague took a shine to me, and he gave me a book. The book's name was High Finance on a Low Budget. He was a super nice veteran of the company who was about to retire and said to me, Tim, make your money work harder for you than you work for it. And that sure resonated with me. So I read his book. I read your book and I started to invest and I became a regular listener of Bob Brinker, who I think you emulate best for us, which is a huge compliment. So I have two questions, Jill. Okay. By the way, I love the lead up. So it's like great context. Fantastic. And you are now uh, retired. How old are you? So I'm 62 and my wife is 60. Mm -hmm. And I've actually been retired for five years. We always had a plan to stop working as soon as we could. My wife and I have things we needed and wanted to do. We find our sense of purpose every day. We learn to live below our means. We value the compound interest. We carry minimal debt. We have an estate plan, we have an emergency fund, uh, a modest future pension for my wife, and we plan to defer our social security as long as we can. So here's my question, Jill. We've been encouraged to move our non-tax deferred investments from a small brokerage firm to in-kind accounts, which was a new term to us, at a large financial management firm that we now use to tax plan. And we, they help us with uh, you know, spending our hard-earned money. Mm -hmm. In this part of our retirement portfolio, we have about a half a million dollars in these taxable accounts in over four mutual funds. We bought them in the early 90s through a friend who at the time worked at a large retail investment company. Mm -hmm. The dividends and investments have been reinvested. The money has grown significantly and we have not touched it. Okay, wait. So let me just pop in here. So this is a taxable account. There's a half a million dollars. It's four mutual funds. There's loads of capital gains inside of these funds, correct? Exactly. Yes. And uh, do you mind me asking which mutual funds these are? So Invesco, Putnam, Fidelity, and the Rochester Muni. It's a muni fund. Okay. And a muni bond fund. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And their investment classes are A and M. Do you have any idea what your cost basis is in these? Just so We threw out a lot of our paperwork. My wife is a needaholic. She threw a lot of that out. But yeah. I mean, that was kind of my question is we would have to calculate that and and to be able to you know declare our capital gains, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, like you can guess. You can say like, you know what? I think it's we put 50 grand or, you know, you could say uh, we think we put $10,000 in four different funds for $40,000 and now it's 500 grand, which by the way, would not be so astonishing giving the given the time horizon because you're talking about the 90s right yes yes yeah. okay and by the way there's a way to figure that out if you really want to make yourself crazy you can go into each of these fund families and kind of look at whatever their average share price was for the year that you think you bought it but you know the irs is not going to bust your chops if you make a reasonable estimate you know, if you say, oh, yeah, I bought this in 1993 for uh, 400000 and now it's 500000 They're not going to, you know what I mean? Like, that's baloney. But you got to take a real number. Okay, so let's just go back for a second. Five hundred grand in these four funds. How much is in the traditional um, retirement accounts? So we have about $2.5 million saved across uh, – a consolidated portfolio with Vanguard. Mm -hmm. And we're using their personal services to help us with the tax management, the withdrawal, all of the spending stuff, which is a lot harder than the saving stuff was. Right, right. 
um, about two and a half million. And my wife's going to have a small pension. And again, we've been listening and we've learned so many things that we're just going to apply in the coming years. But to take this half a million dollars and to move it to from this small brokerage firm to Vanguard in kind, is there... It's Is there okay. any downside to that? No, because what they say in kind, here's what it means. It just means you're basically saying, I have four pieces of furniture in a house. One piece from Invesco, one from Putnam, one from Fidelity, and one in this muni bond fund. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to take it from my old house. I'm going to move it into my new house. And you're just going to move it as is. That's what an in-kind transfer means. It just means that they're taking the assets and you don't have to sell them by the way. So an in-kind transfer literally means it just moves as is. Okay. Got it. And the reason why that might be helpful for you is number one, it consolidates everything right. And into one place, it also might help in terms of your tax planning. So in terms of pulling money from these accounts, have you been pulling money out to uh, float your lifestyle right now? No, not really. Again, mm-hmm. we're, we've been trying to burn down the IRA, traditional IRA, because the RMD is going to kick in and it's mm-hmm. a, kind of a substantial amount of money. So we've heard you talk about, you know, which groups of money to take first and which last. And that's been a great, you know, benefit to listening to your program, hearing people talk about that all the time. But the answer is no. So we haven't taken any out. And how much are you pulling from that IRA account? Every month, about ten thousand dollars, and that's your um, only income. That let, let's call it that hundred twenty grand a year is like pretty much your only income currently, right? Correct. Okay, and is that what your need is? That ten thousand dollars a month? Actually, it's a little more, but you know we've been building up our emergency fund, and we're doing a few other things to support our family and our lifestyle. We've been very fortunate to wait this out, but so it's probably a little bit more. We have no debt, Jill, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, again, one of life lessons. You said a two and a half million dollars is partially traditional, partially Roth. I presume there's a way more money in traditional, right? Correct. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So you're in the 22% tax bracket. You pull that money out. What is the guesstimate on your social security if you were to wait until your full retirement age? So my wife and I will both get a little over $3,000. Each? Each, yes. Okay. So, And then what's how much is her pension? So it'll probably be $40,000. Hmm. That's not bad. No, it's good. Oh, that's good. Exactly. So really, by the time you have the pension and your social security, you're, you're in great shape. You pull a little money out of the IRA as you stay in this 22% tax bracket, which I do think is good. This is a good game plan. It's a great game plan, actually. Moving the money into the into the account with Vanguard makes sense. I think that, look, you're not really pulling money out of those taxable accounts right now. The, the idea would be to come up with some strategy about what we're going to do with that. Okay, we're going to finish up with Tim in just a sec. We're going to pay a few bills, so check it out. JillOnMoney.com. If you've got a question, hit the contact button. We'd be delighted to help you out. JillOnMoney.com. Don't forget to sign up for the free weekly newsletter while you're there. We'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And let's get right back to our caller. It's Tim from the Bay Area. Let's do this. So let me ask a couple questions. Number one, do you have kids? Yes, they're both launched and in a great position in life. We're very proud of them. Fantastic. Do you guys consider yourselves charitably inclined? Yes. Have you ever heard of something called a donor advised fund? So I have, but I'm not familiar with it. Tell me. 
So here's what the cool, this is a very cool thing to do. So a donor advised fund basically is a fund that you can set up and I'm sure you can do it at Vanguard very easily. I know you can do it at Fidelity. They have one as well, but at Vanguard, what they, what they would do is they set up a fund and they say, this is for your charitable giving and you can decide when you put money into this account. You don't have to give the money away the minute you put it in, but what you can do is let's just pretend, let's say that um, you look at your funds, right? And you say, you know what? Eh, this Putnam fund stinks. Let's just pretend. And then let's just, again, let's say there's $100,000 in there. You could essentially say, I want to put the $100,000 from that Putnam fund into a donor advised fund. You could do it in one fell swoop. You can do it a little bit at a time. You can do it however you want. And what that does is it allows you to say whatever today's mark, current market value is goes into the donor advised fund. And as soon as it hits in the fund, it gets sold. Okay. But there's no tax liability to you because it's going into a charitable fund. And why is that so cool? Because it really allows you to leverage the idea that you've saved all this money and you don't have to harvest the gain that you've realized. Again, it only works if you're charitable, right? But you could essentially say, I'm going to put a bunch of money into this charitable fund. I'm going to use the money that has been building up in these taxable accounts. I don't have to pay any tax on that. And I don't have to give this money away. If, if you put in 20000 or fifty or or 100 you don't have to give it away all at once. You can give it away over time. The aspect of this that could be very interesting for someone in your shoes, you and your wife's shoes, is that you might say one year, you know what? We're going to take more money out of the IRA account. And we're actually going to pop up into the 24% tax bracket. In the year that you do that, you might want to take a bigger charitable deduction. And you might put more of your money into this donor advised fund. I think you guys are very prime examples of folks. If again, you have to be charitably inclined, but, and it doesn't cost anything. It's not like you're setting up a foundation. You're just using a different account to distribute money charitably. And the cool thing is, as I said, the timing is really good. If, if God forbid, one of you dies before the other, you could each have a charitable fund. You could have it set up so that you, one can give away after you pass away. But this is a way that you can really take the money that has grown, use it for good and not pay a tax on it. It's kind of cool, right? Yes, I love and it. And so I think that's something to consider. And by the way, moving everything over, making that in-kind transfer, you'll be able to facilitate a lot of this tax planning with the person. Do you have a dedicated person at Vanguard or do you get whoever you get when you call? No, we have a great advisor. We do the personal advisory services, so it's only like 0.3 and so. Okay, great. Fantastic. And it will allow you to feel like you can take advantage of a year when you have a big tax year and a year where you don't have such a big tax year. And you can let this money kind of percolate. The, you know, look, the only downside is I think that once it's in the donor advised fund, it usually sits in cash. But so what? You're going to give it away and you'll figure it out. I think it's a great idea for you. So we now have dealt with your in-kind transfer, your low basis taxable account, you're pulling money out of your IRA and you said there was a second question. What was that? So my second question is, before my wife and I retired, we contributed as much as we could to an HSA, a health savings account. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we've spent most of this money. A month mm -hmm. before I retired, I had a major health event. I actually was coming out of spin class and I had a blood clot in my heart. I was very, very, very fortunate that my first responders and healthcare providers at the ready. So one bad thing happened and many, many good things happened. Holy crap. Wait a second. Let's just go back for this for a second. You come out of spin class. What are you feeling like? Just so I can monitor myself on my bike and of course, freak out every time I think I feel. What was the symptom you felt? I, I was pretty self-aware and I didn't have anything in my jaw or my left arm, but across my shoulders, I felt really tight. And my wife had just left to go home to get ready to go to work. It was a snowy day here in Rochester. I went over to stretch and my shoulders got tighter and I stuck that shortness of breath. And again, it's a long story, but two hours later, I was sitting in recovery saying, what the heck happened? God. 
I know. I mean, I was going to retire a month after that. And... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. OK, so I'm so happy you're well. So but you drained all the money out of the HSA in this whole process. Is that what you're saying? Just about. I mean, and, and I'm not complaining. We're very fortunate. Yeah. We have a high deductible health care insurance, but we still pay a lot of money for recurring visits and monthly medicines. And, mm. and I'm not complaining, but I'm just wondering, are there any options to contribute to the HSA? Mm. Can you get a job again? You want to get a job? If you do that, then you can. But if you don't have a job, you can't. Earned income then, right? Yeah, unfortunately. How much are you paying for your insurance, your health insurance right now? I'm not going to give you exact number, but it's gone up quite a bit. I mean, healthcare in retirement, especially pre-Medicare, is pretty expensive, even though here in Rochester, we have competition and it's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't kill us, but it's a big number. Is it 20 grand a year-ish? Yes. Okay, good. That's okay. You have the money to pay for it. And I'm glad you asked about the HSA. It's very expensive, but you know what? You're right. This is a three to five year problem right? Three years till you get Medicare. You'll have supplemental Medicare, right? Your cost of healthcare is going to go down five years from now. It will be lower. There's nothing you can really do unless for some reason you get a job, which doesn't sound like you are. Like I said, thank God you have the money. You're in great shape. You're in fantastic shape. I'm very thankful because Jill, when I hear you say grit, growth, and grace, I add gratitude I remind myself every day is a gift. Listen to this. I feel the same way as Tim. I'm going to have gratitude. Let's just say that gratitude is like underlying grit, growth, grace. I think that gratitude underlies grace, but I'm so glad that you said that because it's good for Mark to hear that. He doesn't like the soft, mushy me. I think you're in fantastic shape. I am so glad that you guys have done all the hard work that you've done. Okay, if you, like Tim, want to know whether you're on track for retirement, just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com or better yet, bookmark our website, JillOnMoney.com. Hit that contact button whenever something comes up. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here to try to help you navigate your financial life, whatever your next best choice really is. Mark, I had like an intervention with friends of mine over the weekend. You will love this. They were looking to put a bid in on a hot house and we went to the uh, open house with them and we looked at it and, you know, I tried to stay neutral, which is nearly impossible for me, but um, I think I did a good job. And then I wasn't wildly enthusiastic. I, I really said, what do you want to do? And it's hard when it's your friends because you really know everything that's going on. They had a little bit of a fight while we were all in the car. That's always fun. And the long story short is that I thought they were spending too much money on this idea. And knowing everything I know about their financial life, I knew they could afford it. I just felt like... Yeah, just because you afford it doesn't mean you should do it because you might be putting yourself at some risk, which is, you know, I, I just let it be. And you know what they said? This is amazing. We hear this all the time. They kept saying like, oh, we want a nice house for everyone to come visit us. You know, like all the kids, they have four kids. I said, well, you mean you're, you're going to spend an extra, you're spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars extra on this house for this maybe twice a year where all four of your kids and their yet unborn grandchildren are going to come maybe twice a year. So the next day they called me up and they said, we took the bid, they put a bid in and then they took it back and they said, they're done. I said, that's great. But you know, it, it was really, um, I think it was instructive. It's good for me to hear this, just even like how people think about it. Gang, we don't want to make these big, huge financial decisions for these events and or the desire. Oh, I want this to be the family gathering place. You know what? Your family's going to gather wherever you are. They don't really care whether they have an extra bedroom or not. That's just my two cents. Okay. So anyway, if you've got a question about real estate, we've gotten a lot of real estate questions. Do give us a, a shout. Again, the website is 
jillonmoney.com and just hit the good old contact button. That's all you need to do. jillonmoney.com, the contact button. Okay. John is 54 years old. He manages his own investments. He's married. He says, everything seems to be on track. He says, I want to retire in the next two to three years. The issue is that the issue, he says, the issue is my asset allocation. That's not your issue. I'll tell you that right now, mister. Your issue is that you're going to have a retirement that is going to last three to maybe four decades. You will actually be retired longer than you work in this plan, but let's go on. Uh, yeah, you're going to be unemployed for 30 to 40 years. Okay. Overall, he says 60, 40 is his allocation. Most of the bonds are in retirement accounts. I moved to bonds late last year uh, because my overall portfolio was getting a little too aggressive for our liking. So they moved to from like, say, 75%, 25% into more like a 60, 40. He says, if I retire at 57 and the market crashes, I can't access or rebalance using the bonds in the retirement funds. I looked into the rule of 55. My current account, 401k, has a stipulation that at 55, I can only make one withdrawal, which would be a tax disaster. If I withdrew all of it, over 700000 how do I keep a tax-efficient portfolio with bonds and retirement accounts and still be able to have a drawdown and rebalance strategy? Uh, Mark, would you like to guess what my answer is to this? It's very easy, John. Why are you why are you retiring so early? I, and this is what I'm guessing, because he says he said that he has seven hundred thousand dollars in his retirement account. So you know what I'm um, interpolating from this? I think John is a teacher and I or something like that and has a pension. What do you think? I think it's probably a good guess, but he needs more money to retire than the actual pension amount. So um, here is what I'm going to tell you. You don't need a drawdown and rebalance strategy if you keep working. Why don't you do that? Why don't you work till you're 59 and a half? What's going on here, John? I don't like this game plan at all. You don't think he's going to keep working? I can't give him the answer then. We're going to get him on the air. Let's get He said he would come on the air, but then you tried to wrangle him and he didn't. If you say you're going to come on the air, then come on the air. We need more info. Dawn writes, she's 48 years old. She's been in the Navy for 30 years. How about that? And she says she is now eligible for retirement at age 48, by the way. Uh, and it, she would earn 75% of her base pay, which is about $7,500 a month. Every year I stay in, the pension increases by 2.5%. <gasps> wow. Um, and she says, you know, she says at 32 years in, right? So she gets to age 50, she gets to 80%, but it means I'm working for 20% of my pay. No, that does not mean what you're, what that, that is not at all what that means. It means that you continue to accumulate and accrue a benefit and you don't have to dip into your, any other retirement accounts. And if you want to find something else to do, sure, you should go do that. But that's not the, I don't think that's the way to think about it. I've heard this from teachers also where they say like, oh, you know, I'm just, now it's not worth it for me to work. Really? Is that the only thing you're working for is to actually create your, um, a bigger retirement benefit? The only way that this starts to actually make a difference to me is when people will say to me, oh, well, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to keep working because my pension benefit stops and I hate what I do. So if you don't hate what you do, keep doing it. How about that? Okay, it's Jill on Money. When we return, more of your questions. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are broadcasting from the Sleep Number Virtual Studios, where Mark and I will remain probably forever. One of uh, my friends at CBS asked me if we were ever going back into our studio, and I laughed out loud, Mark. Forget it. I said, no, we're never going back in there. 
And the one reason that we really did love going in there is that we would siphon off some guests who came into the morning show, CBS This Morning. Now it's called CBS Mornings. And we don't even have that anymore. So now it's like, forget it. Let's get to a question before we finish up the hour. Jennifer loves the show and she says, I'm in the process of ending a 24-year marriage and learning to manage all of my family's finances on my own. That's after taking the back seat to these responsibilities during the marriage. She writes, big mistake. She says, learning now and loving it. Your show has made the learning curve shorter and much more manageable. Thank you. That's so good. Question. Is an HSA a good choice for my family? Can you give me the pros and cons of an HSA? Share anything I should be thinking about as I make this choice. Thank you and Mark for all the help. Your show has been truly life-changing. How about that, Mark? Truly life-changing. Okay, health savings accounts are great. Here's how they work. They pair an, a savings account with a high deductible health plan. So a health savings account is really um, sort of like it's half of it. The cool thing about an HSA is that you can use money that you set aside with a tax benefit at any time in the future to pay for qualified medical expenses. So again, you have to have a high deductible health plan. And that means that you, if you do, you can put a uh, a bunch of money away. So for 2021, you can contribute, uh, let's say, 7200 7, bucks for family coverage. And it goes up a little bit every year. There's a big deductible. But all of this is to say that it's a very good um, way to save for health expenses, especially for um, somebody who's young and healthy. I think it's a great idea. So if you have follow-up questions, Jennifer, or any other financial questions, give us a holler. We'd love to hear from you. Again, it's Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. If you're on the website, jillonmoney.com, hit the contact button. And don't forget that while you're there, we've got all these great resources. So check them out at jillonmoney.com. We will be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. It's hour number two, and we're not going to do a guest this weekend, this hour, because Mark says we've got so many emails and calls and people want to get on the air with us that we just have to concentrate on that. So forgive me. We we do have lots of great guests that are lined up this fall, but I, I want to be clear that we're, we're not... We're not going to forget you. You guys, you're the backbone of the program, okay? So if you're on our website, jillonmoney.com, all you need to do is click the contact button. And while you're on the website, just check out all the great stuff that's there. You can read things that we write. You can listen to old shows. You can watch TV segments. Uh, there's a great resource section that Mark maintains. It's fantastic. So check it out, jillonmoney.com. And if you are, wandering around in there. Just remember, hit the contact button and we are here for you. Uh, and don't forget to tell us, whatever that question is, if you are willing to join us to hop on into the Sleep Number Virtual Studios, we'd love to have you. So come on, do it, do it, do it, do it. Okay, so uh, let's answer a question here. This is from Mark, not my Mark, but a one of you named Mark. Subject retired, what accounts to withdraw from first? Okay. So Mark is a podcast listener and he says, I hear you also hear you on local radio. I always appreciate the advice to others and your thinking falls in line with mine. Isn't that the truth though, Mark? We just seem to all like flock to the people that are more like us. I get it. I know we should try to expand, but this in financial stuff, it does make more sense to do that. Here's the question. What account should I, should my wife and I start withdrawing from? We are not withdrawing from retirement accounts yet. Here are the details. He will be 65 in December. He retired at age 61. He plans on claiming his Social Security retirement benefit at age 70. Okay, great. The wife is 59 
and she continues to work and she will take her social security at her full retirement age of 67. Okay. He has the following income, $65,000 a year before taxes from a pension. That's nice. An IRA, 620,000 managed via an advisor. It's a 70, 30 split. Okay. Hmm, This is interesting. A Roth, $93,000 $93,000 with an advisor. It's 100% stocks. Vanguard Roth, 61000 70 30 stock to bond. Wife, uh, her income is $25,000 after taxes. So she's got a direct sales business. She's got 100% of all of her money in equities. So 92000 IRA, 25000 Roth. They've got some money in cash, um, some mutual funds, no debt. Their uh, house they own outright. Monthly expense is about $6,000. So that's kind of nice. The current income, the pension, and the self employment income get them by, but barely next year. He's going to be 65. He wants to supplement with $1,000 to $2,000 uh, a month. Uh, and that's his question. So, Mark, what do you think? I'm sort of thinking let's get money out of that IRA right now and start making this. Uh, he's going to end up having to take required minimum distributions. I'm thinking he's going to start, let's do it right now. Let's get some money out of there and pay the taxes on it. What do you think? Yeah, we want you to reduce these required minimum distributions. So use your IRA and um, whatever you think you're going to need. So if it's like 25 grand a year that you think you're going to need, that money should be in cash. By the way, maybe you should, since you're going to start drawing down on that IRA, maybe you should be more like 60-40 and smooth out the ride. That's what I'm thinking. I think that there's no reason for you to really put so much risk on the table. I mean, you got plenty of money because of this pension. And clearly, once you take your Social Security, you'll be fine. But I would take from the IRA. And uh, I don't know if your wife, that, I wonder if that IRA is an old IRA that she has. But what I would do is she should only be using a Roth contribution. And what's up with the management with an advisor? Uh, that kind of also was a flag for me because here's the thing, Mark, he would not ask me a question if this guy was really whoever or gal was giving him advice. Why are they asking me? Reading between the lines, I think it's like I've got a Vanguard Roth because why do I really, if you're a hundred percent in stocks in your Roth, move that. How about this also while you're at it, let's move the uh, Roth with the ma- the manager, that advisor I'm putting in quotes. You can't even see me. I'm doing air quotes. Um, just move it into the Vanguard Roth and call it a day. And why do we need the advisor at all? Like this is not that hard a situation because you have that amazing income from your pension. Why do you need to pay an advisor? Doesn't make sense to me, Mark. Not at all. Especially since you're asking me this question. This is a question that you would normally ask your advisor. And since you're not asking your advisor, what I'm thinking is you don't think that advisor's so hot. Just saying. My guess. Okay. Um, if we're missing something, give us a shout and let us know. Mike writes, I am 62 years old and I have close to $175,000 in my 401k. I have a very aggressive account. Now that I'm closer to retirement, I'm thinking of transferring all the money into a life cycle index. This is with TIAA CREF. I mean, when are you going to draw this money down? That's number one, Mike. So that's a big question. It's okay to have a very aggressive account if you say, I'm never touching the money. If you think you're really going to need the money, um, maybe you don't have to do this all at once. Maybe you could just take some of the money and start to cycle it into lower risk options. But I'm not sure you need to make such a drastic move. You know, it's a funny thing retirement is not an all or nothing proposition. It usually means that your your lifestyle is changing and your need for money is changing, but very rarely do you need all of your money in one fell swoop. So maybe having some sort of game plan about how you're going to access that money, what you're going to need. If you think of these two emails together, think of them as this idea that the money you think you're going to need within the next year or two, you keep in cash. And then the rest of the allocation should be a more 
a reasonable amount of risk considering that you're going to be taking money out in the future. Now, it's really fine with me if you're retired and you say, here's an account, I'm going to retire, but I never need to touch it, then you don't really, unless you are sensitive to risk, then you don't really have to worry. So that's something to really keep in mind. That I think that that's an important concept here, that the need for your money, so when you're going to access your money, how much you're going to access, and that's going to really be the determining factor in your asset allocation. Okay? Very good. All right. So this is a program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. Mark tells me he's got a very excellent caller that is queued up and ready to go. So if you would like to come on the program with us, you want to join us in the Sleep Number Studios, the Sleep Number Virtual Studios, that is, uh, then just give us a holler. Go to the website, jillonmoney.com, click the contact button, and we will do the rest. Mark will do the rest. I won't do anything except answer your questions. So do that. Make that happen. Okay. Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here to help you figure out where you want to go next in your financial life. I am Jill Schlesinger. Mark Talercio is running the show and my life. And uh, I am delighted that you guys are joining us, spending some time with us this weekend. If you have a financial question, all you need to do is contact us. How do you do that? Two different ways. One, you can go onto the website, jillonmoney.com. That's how Mark says most of you are contacting us. So I'm going to lead with that from now on. jillonmoney.com, click on the contact button. Alternatively, you can just send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. And of course, don't forget to tell us if you want to come on the air live with us. That would be really fantastic. Um, By the way, if you're on the website, just bookmark it. And while you're there, make sure that you subscribe to our two sister broadcasts. We have two podcasts. One is called Eye on Money. That comes out twice a week. And the other is called Jill on Money. That's the the longer established program. That comes out daily, seven times a week. Unbelievable, right? Every single day. And those podcasts are similar, except I will say the Eye on Money podcast features none other than the voice of Mark Talercio. Yep, he does that one with me. Uh, And that's really, that's the main difference. Otherwise, we sort of do all this stuff in a similar way. And, um, you know, we try to just maintain a a straight and narrow approach to your financial life. Today, we are going to be joined by a caller, and it is Lois who is on the line from Texas. Hello, Lois. How can we help you out? Hello, Jill. Thank you so much. It's so good to chat with you. And I know that if anyone could help me answer this question, it's you. I am a single mother of one fabulous nine-year-old daughter, and and I'm maybe on paper successful. You know, everybody can look introspectively and say another thing, but, um, you know, I make in the low 200s from a salary perspective. I have a decent little investment portfolio, but I wonder, is there more that I could be doing? You know, I work with so many colleagues who get these investment opportunities coming to them, and Mm. I haven't found those opportunities coming my way. And I wonder if there's more, whether it's through, you know, my own self-funded investment accounts, whether it's through third party, you hear about these websites that help you find companies to invest in. What is out there for people like me who may not be the savviest when it comes to financial planning, but I'm really eager to learn more. And I've I've taken that very seriously over the course of the past 18 months. Well, I love this, by the way. This is a great question. So first, let's do some of your like where you stand right Mm -hmm. now. Single mom, Lois, how old are you? 
I'm 47. Just turned. Why did you say it with that low voice? (laughs) What's going on with you? I'm just kidding. I've I've had a little self-deprecation about that age for quite some time. (laughs) Okay. You know what's so funny? Yeah. I mean, I think maybe I must have been five years. So I'm 55. And five years ago, I said something to my agent about, oh, you know what? As a 50-year-old, he goes, don't ever tell anybody your age. And I said to the agent, I'm like, are you a moron? There's something called the internet. Everyone knows how old I am. (laughs) You know, like, don't be ridiculous. And he's like, oh, that's true. He goes, we used to not want to tell women in broadcasting to tell their age. And so I was like, you know what? I got to own it. I can't. I can't. And let me just say one other thing. Every decade gets better. Every decade gets better. So you're in the FU 40s, which is the (laughs) fabulous. It's fantastic. It's like, you don't, that's when you're like, oh, I don't really care what anyone thinks. There is something to that. There is something to that, which gave me the, which gave me the confidence to do this with you today. See that? We're like kindred spirits. Okay. And you're a youngster. Okay. So you make in the low 200s, you got the nine-year-old daughter. Tell me about how your cash flow looks right now. How much money are you putting into retirement right now? So I max out my 401k every single month. Um, I don't have a lot of expenses. I have a mortgage. I pay a little bit extra. Um, it's My mortgage is about $2,500 a month. I uh, pay my property taxes once a year. I don't have any other debt. Other than that, I lease a car for about 500 bucks a month. And then I put an additional $1,000 into an account with Edward Jones, for example. And I use someone to help me allocate those those resources into different funds and ETFs. Mm -hmm. And then I put some money in savings and and I put a lot of money in savings in the past and I'm sitting on what I feel like is an emergency savings account, but could be a little bit too much cash. That's just not doing enough for me. How much is in there? It's 183,000. That's just in the, the cash account that I have on hand right now. What's your burn rate? Like how much a month do you really spend? Anywhere. It depends on how much shopping I do. I'm not going to lie or travel. And now that mm-hmm. things have opened up, I've started traveling between seven and 10 a month, I would say. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I, I'm never yeah. negative. I'll put it that way. I'm never negative every month. How much is the house worth? It's about 750000 according to a recent appraisal. And you're going to stay where you are, right? No, I'm actually looking to either, I'm going to stay in my neighborhood and housing Mm -hmm. prices have just escalated right now. We're in a very good school district. Uh, I'm either going to look to sell it or to lease it out to try and generate a little bit of cash flow from a rental perspective and take the depreciation on the home. Look at you. How much is the outstanding mortgage balance? 490, I believe. And what's the interest rate on the mortgage? Three something, three seven. I, I had a divorce, which impacted this. It was very depressed. Bastard. Yeah. I'm yeah, sorry. It was, just, it was awful. It reminds me of there's this old card that my sister ran across that we were laughing so hard because we got to it for a friend of ours. And it said, there are two sides to the divorce. And on the front cover, it says yours. And you open it up and it says the a-holes. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Uh, 3.7 is actually kind of expensive now, but if you're going to sell it, then we're not doing anything with it. And frankly, if you're going to use it as a rental property, that would change the dynamic Mm -hmm. of what you would do with it. How much would you have to pay to get into a house that you'd want to buy? Very close to a million, 1.1 in in my, in my market. We are just at such a big bubble right now. I'm looking to stay under a million, but if I'm I'm looking to do that, that's going to be very tough. Are you only considering selling simply because you want rental property or do you want to actually, do you need a different house? I think a a different property would suit our needs a little bit better. I bought this while I was going through a divorce and um, I think a, a different, a different property would definitely serve us better given our lifestyle now and how we're living. Gotcha. Nine-year-old daughter, money saved for college or not? We do. We have about $80,000 in an account for her right now. What kind of an account? Is it a 529 or no, a, a custodial account? It's a custodial account. Okay. So you're putting 19500 into your 401k. You're mm-hmm. putting $1,000 a month into your Eddie Jones account. You got a bunch of money in savings. You got this house that's bubbling up. Retirement savings, what do you have? 401k is about five. 40, 550, depending on the fluctuations of the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, I only have about $40,000 in an IRA. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just did a Roth conversion and I've got about 250,000 in the, in the other investment accounts in the self-funded investment accounts that is taxable. So the money that you just said, the 40 grand is now Roth? Correct. Yeah. Great. And yeah. the pe- tax has been paid already. You've done Correct. that. 
Yes. Great. And the 401k at work, is it traditional or is it a Roth 401k? It's a traditional. Do you have a Roth option? That's a good question. <laughs> find out about that. I mean, you're single. And yeah. so that means you're in a, you're in the, depending on how much you really make, you know, you could be seeing your, most of your income, you know, at the highest rate is 32%. Mm-hmm. No state income tax in Texas, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. That's why you usually have crappy schools. That's why you got to stay in that district, yep, right? Absolutely. And pay high mm-hmm. property taxes. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. Um, okay. So first of all, I get your question, but I'm going to tell you something that's so funny. All those things that other people like, oh, I want a hedge fund. I want an alternative investment. That I just think it's baloney. I think that a lot of people talk this stuff up. I think that for someone like you, you're a great earner. You're socking away money. And I think what you may find is that if you actually just keep it almost plain vanilla, you're going to be better off. And that maybe we can do things that are smarter with your money and have you make a greater return just by changing some of the structures. Okay, we'll get back to Lois's question in just a second. If you've got a question yourself, just go to JillOnMoney.com and click the contact button. We'll get that note. All right, we will be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here to try to help you figure out what on earth you're going to do with your financial life. We are joined today by a listener. And remember, we love to have you guys come on the air with us, and it's very easy to do. Why do we like that? Because when you send us an email, it's fantastic. You give us lots of details. But often, as you will hear in this conversation that we continue with Lois, the the conversation leads to other parts of the planning process. And it also lets me hear some of the emotions behind what is going on in your life. And make no mistake about it. This is numbers. I know it sort of feels like, oh, it's cut and dry, but not always. There's always an emotional component to these conversations. So uh, let's continue with our conversation with Lois from Texas. So for example, I'm looking at that custodial account. That should be a 529 account. There's no doubt. Like there's no reason for you to have a taxable account that's a custodial account when you have a 529 option. And again, everyone listening, the reason why I like 529 so much is not because I like to say those numbers in a row. It's because it's essentially like having a Roth for education. You're putting a post-tax dollar in. There is no taxation associated with that account as long as you use the money for education. And so that's a tax-free way of investing, which to me is the greatest way to invest, tax-free. So I would shift that custodial account into a 529 plan. So that's number one. Now, number two, the house thing, I know that it seems great to be, you know, oh, I want passive income in this, but you know, you really lose a lot of liquidity. If you keep that house, then what do you, you, then you're going to soak up all your cash And then how are you going to manage two houses? You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel a little bit nervous about that. Whereas if you sell it right now and you've got 250 grand that, you know, let's say it's 200 after costs and all that. And now you've got your down payment. Now you're in your million, million dollar house. Great. That's fine. But to have both of those houses would actually mean you would have a much lower amount of liquidity. And I think that single mom who's, you know, rocking and rolling, having liquidity is kind of great. Unless you're really into the rental market and you want like, oh, I really want to do this, or I have a friend who does this for a living and would help me and you really want to do it. It's just a lot of money to get tied up in real estate. Yeah, no, I think you bring up a really good point there. I am not a great house person. So I would have to pay someone to change the air filters like I do now, mm-hmm. pay someone to maintain it for me. This you, you bring up a great point there. 
Yeah. So, I mean, we don't want to necessarily do that. Okay. But selling the house and rolling up is fine. I wouldn't do that in a hurry, by the way, unless you found something fantastic and you're like, I got to jump on this, or you knew I had an inside track on something that could get you into a house that you'd really like. That's different. By and large, I think sit still right now. Uh, you know, we, we've been interviewing lots of economists who are kind of have been noting that this is a crazy dislocated market right now. And so you don't have to worry about refinancing because you're going to sell the place, but you do have to just be patient. You do have a house to live in, which is great. Your hand is not forced. So be patient here. Okay. Now let's get to this Edward Jones. How do you pay the Edward Jones broker by with a fee or with commissions? That's a great question. I inherited this broker from my grandparents because I they, they set up some money there. And I've been with this Edward Jones, fo- these Edward Jones folks for more than 20 years. And this oh, my is, God. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where I think I have a little frustration. I am not as I pay fees mm-hmm. and I am not as proactive, aggressive and assertive with this person who manages my money as I am with everyone I work with in my daily life. This is, this is a therapy session. Joe, I love I, that. Right? I'm, uh, we've got plenty of time. I'll tell you when your time is up. This account you said has a couple hundred thousand in it, right? It does. It has with, with the Roth, with the individual account. I had her create a stock account for me, you know, and getting some tech funds. I've got about 300,000 in there in total. What's the fee that you pay? I don't know. I don't okay. know. So, I'm going to tell you something right now. Do you know what smart people do to make money? Really? The forget about the hedge fund or alternative investments or the best new stock. What they do is they they cherry pick ways to save money risk free. One way is to reduce taxes. The other way is to reduce fees. And so I'm just going to give a guess uh, that this broker, this lovely person is probably charging 1%, probably around 1%, but maybe it would, it's more. So the first thing that you really are entitled to do is to say to this advisor, I've taken the opportunity of the pandemic to get a lot more in touch with um, my financial life. And I have a few very specific questions for you. Number one, what is the fee that I'm paying on this account? What is the annual fee? And number two, are there any other costs associated with our relationship? That's it. Let's get that number. Because here's the thing. You don't need this broker. I mean, you may like this person, but you don't need this person. And if I said to you, well, we know one way to actually increase your return would be for you to actually fire the broker and either do it yourself or you could use a robo advisor. You could literally just go to any place like Vanguard or Schwab or Betterment, and you could essentially have that money managed with an algorithm, just like the rich people do. I mean, it's really easy to do, and it would be a fraction of the cost. If you feel like you want to, you know, maintain some relationship, you could leave a little bit of money there. But my guess is that Unless this person is actually doing full-blown financial planning for you all the time and really in your face and just like, what can I do to help you? How can I help you with your career? How can I help you with this? I mean, the very mere fact that there's a custodial account and this person hasn't said move it into a 529 plan kind of proves to me not the greatest advisor in the world. That's just my two cents. I agree. Yep. Absolutely. Now, does it feel awful for you to think about firing her? Not necessarily. I'm not, I don't, you know, it's, you, you hate to fire people because, you know, we all have to do that sometimes, but, mm-hmm. um, but no, I, my, I, I value my money more than that relationship, not to sound too callous, but not at all. Okay. We, we saw a little bit more to finish up with Lois. I know it, it's, see, I'm going to tell you when you come on the air with us, there's more to ask. So uh, if you've got a financial question, let us know. It's ask Jill at jillonmoney.com or hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. 
You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here to try to take the mystery out of your financial life. And we do that by answering questions that you ask us. You can send us your questions by hopping onto our website, jillonmoney.com. And while you're there, there is a contact button. It's in the upper right-hand corner. And all you need to do is click on the contact button. You tell us what the question is. That's the easy part, right? Um, but, you know, sometimes we need to go deeper. We want to kind of get into this with you. And the way that we do that is Mark is so smart. Mark, when did we start doing the um, the the electronic studio? Like, how do, when did that happen? It was before COVID, right? I think it was like late of 2019. But why did we do it? Did we do it because of uh, your kid? Like, how did this all? I don't remember. Right. I think that's right. I think that we just were trying to figure out how do we make sure that Mark doesn't have to schlep uptown because I was already in the building and make this a much easier process. And now like a well-oiled machine, it works beautifully. Anyway, because we don't have a physical studio anymore, it makes it even better. We can actually bring you on the air seamlessly. And Mark does everything. So if you just send us your question, it's it's great. And, and you just send us the note and say, I want to come on the air. Mark does everything else. It's funny because uh, the old sleep number studio, which uh, cracks me up because they say it's smart, effortless, and comfortable. And so that's exactly what this is, smart, effortless, and comfortable. Also, I want to mention that we are sponsored by Facet Wealth. So many of you have financial planning questions and issues, and you want to ask us those questions. But if you need an outside professional, even though Mark and I are both CFPs, we don't do this for a living per se. We are broadcasters for a living. Facet Wealth, they do it every day. Facet Wealth provides financial planning for a lot of different kinds of people because they don't have wealth, nor do they have account minimums. Facet is attempting to meet you where you are. That's kind of great. And they do that with flat fee, conflict-free planning. You get a dedicated certified financial planner. That means someone who's going to look out for you and work in your best interest. And they will conduct this goal-based financial planning. I think it's a really good model and you should check them out. So check out our sponsor, facetwealth.com. Okay, let's finish up with Lois. She is still on the line from Texas. So let's get back to Lois. So then the next question is, what else should you be doing? And if, you know, in terms of, you know, putting money away, I understand that feeling that other people have this, this knack for buying stuff that you don't have opportunities to buy. And I want to give you this feedback. And it's really just from a ton of experience, you know, 30 years plus years in this business, there is no super duper great Oz behind that curtain. The best way that you are going to achieve your goals is to keep doing what you're doing, working hard, saving money, and keeping your expenses down and taking advantage of the tax code where you can. That's really all you need to do. If you want to experiment and buy some stocks and get an app and do some fun things, fine. But you know what? That's actually, I mean, if you just do this boring w approach you will get where you want to go. You will. There's no doubt in my mind because you're a good saver. I worry that someone like you, you make a lot of money. You're probably around a lot of people who have a lot of money that when you reach for that great idea that someone says, well, you know, you need to have X amount of dollars to get, you know, and it is true. Hedge funds usually have a minimum amount. And, you know, even that, they, there's no proof that hedge funds actually make more money than a boring portfolio of index funds. And the main reason is that in my experience for most hedge funds, they charge an exorbitant amount of money, which is 2% a year plus 20% of the upside. You know who gets rich with hedge funds? Hedge fund managers. Some of them are very good friends of mine and some of them are, have been family members of mine, but it is just not so, it, it's really hard for someone like you or me that, you know, we're professional women and we want to feel like we're part of something and someone's got the inside track, it's kind of baloney. Once I realized that, I was like, oh, then no one needs to spin their wheels. We can just do what we do, which is save and invest for the long term. 
it's kind of like life. Everyone thinks there's some sort of magic bullet professionally or, you know, whether you're in your personal life with health and fitness, whatever it is, it's it's the work that gets you there is basically what you're saying. It's the boring stuff that makes it happen. And, and I think that's so important for people to hear because I needed to hear that commitment to the boring stuff, the work that makes it happen. You're doing a great job. You're raising this kid. You're doing it all with your own with like your own grit. And you are absolutely doing what you should be doing. There is not another exciting, sexy thing that would make you do something more. And and to that point, I would just say, you're doing a great job. Mazel tov to you. I'd like you to walk away from this conversation feeling like not less than, but like, holy moly, I am pretty damn good. Thank you. I, th- I think I need to hear that, but I feel like others need to hear that too, because I know I'm not alone there. I mean, I just... That, that reinforcement there from you is so meaningful and so helpful. And, and the truth bombs that you've given me are, are so actionable as well. I feel good about this. I feel so much better. I do. In the, um, in the lingo of the therapeutic session, I'm sorry, our time is up and I will not see you next week, but you can feel free to stay in touch with us. Lois in Texas, I wish you all the best. If you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to contact us, okay? I will do it. Thank you. Okay. If you, like Lois, want to join us on the air, remember jillonmoney.com. Just bookmark it. It's so easy. And then every time you have a financial question, you go to the bookmark and boom, hit the contact button. All right. That's how easy it is. Jillonmoney.com. Okay. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we finish up the program, I just want to squeeze in uh, one more question. And don't forget, if you would like to join us here in the Sleep Number Studios, all you have to do is send us a note and say, I want to come on the air. Mark does everything else. This is from Raymond. And the question is about credit cards. Something, by the way, I very rarely answer these kinds of questions, but I have been hearing a lot about this. I think it's because more people are getting credit cards these days. Um, And the question is, are these rewards programs really a benefit to an individual consumer like me, or are they just another business gimmick? Should I start using one for all of my purchases? I mean, look, I think that generally speaking, if you do these cash back rewards and you just stick to one card, it's probably is better. Mark, do you, what do you do? So Mark says he uses the Amazon rewards card and he says it's kind of cool because anything he buys, he gets some cash back, but it is better if you're going to do one of these cards to stick to one and get the best benefit. And there, you know, just Google an article about, you know, best rewards cards because you know, I'm never writing that article, right, Mark? Forget it. Uh, And be like Mark and do that. By the way, Mark, I don't do that. I should, shouldn't I? But you know what? I'm kind of an American Express kind of gal. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> Mark says the rich people don't need rewards. Let me tell you why I love American Express. This is not sponsored by American Express, but they have an excellent fraud detection. They really do. It is amazing to me. Um, and I think that's the state of the art is re- going on right there. So anyway, thanks to my friends over at American Express who quickly replaced my business card after seeing that Somebody was trying to buy a very large um, electronic system at Best Buy with my card number. Hmm, Not so quick. All right. If you've got a question, head to the website, jillonmoney.com. Hit the contact button. Let us know what we can do for you and try to do something nice for someone else today. Everyone is in transition right now, gang. We all can use a little lift. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. I am Jill Schlesinger, and we are so grateful, Mark and I are so grateful that you listen every weekend. Please let us know if there's anything we can help you out with. Be nice, be good, be safe. We'll talk to you next week.